Good morning, everybody. Yes, Mikey's at work. Um, I was in the Beast looking around, and I found this. It appears to be Watchtower's very first video. Now, I apologize for the bad quality of the picture and the audio. It's from 1966. You know how it was back then. Um, but it looks like it's a, called Heritage. And so you all enjoy. Have a great day. Bye. Why is the world we live in a world full of hatred, violence, fear? A world of competition seeking attention. It is a world seeking pleasure and excitement. But in spite of outward appearances, for far too many it is a world of loneliness, of frustration, an unsatisfied generation. Why do many fear loneliness? A sense that loneliness, purity, and frustration? Is this their only heritage in life? What's the matter with you? Why are you so down? Live it right. But what is right? Well, I don't know. How else can you find out? I just feel like getting everything I can out of life. Me too. But I want a nice life. A happy one. Is this the way? I wish someone would really tell me. Many young people want the answers. But they don't always show it and generally will not admit it. Often their air of self-confidence conceals a deep-rooted need for attention. Their loneliness and insecurity drive them into conformity rather than into becoming the individual they claim to be. Hey, man! When I get a car, I don't want no souped-up job. I'm going to get me a real boss sports car. And when I get on the road, those cops get out of the way. I'm going to take off so fast that he does get the car. Come off it, man. This car here will catch anything on the road. Who's going to get you a sports car, you said? You said yourself he hasn't been alone here for three weeks. I don't need my dead or anyone else. I got you this whiskey, did I? Come on, man. Will you quit the bragging? Let's crack it. Once a young person feels committed to a way of life, what can he do? To change takes courage. It takes conviction that his present course is frustrating and dangerous. Where can he turn for the answers? Love was real. How could I know? If the mother had only told me, if she hadn't always made me feel so alone. I'm so mixed up. I can't face it. I'd rather be dead. What is the tragedy taking place among so many young people of our generation? A young person is not usually bad, unless he's been molded that way by his environment. His life is the product of his home, his family. If that foundation fails him, what does he have to fall back on? If there is no parental love present to secure that foundation, it can even destroy him. Of course, not all frustration leads to complete disaster. But what of all those who are unhappy misfits, who know there's something better, who have hidden hopes and ideals? I always get the creeps when I come home to this empty house. It's like everybody was dead. Mm -hmm. 
mother's probably off making an impression someplace at her club. I wonder if Daddy will be home late as usual. I'd almost be glad if he beat me. At least he'd be showing me some attention. Maybe someday I shouldn't even bother to come home. Many parents are home. But is that enough? Children need attention. Every day there is an excitement of accomplishment. Minor tragedies to meet. And they need someone to share them with. A series of disappointments separating father and son can start the child down that lonely road that plunges him into frustration. Children need guidance and training. If these are withheld for any reason, confidence in the parent is lost. Oh, Mother, can't you stay sober just one day? My girlfriends were coming over for a party, and I wanted to bake some cookies. Love can turn can't to you hate. Can help me with that? Or be misdirected into some perverted Mother, channel. Come on, get up. Get up, come on. No wonder Daddy left you. You old drunk. A busy world demands much of our time. A whole family together like this one is rare. What an opportunity. What's this? Just a family quarrel? No, it is far more serious than that. What is it doing to this family? Can you digest your supper when you are hurt or angry? Can you do your homework or household chores? Could you face your schoolmates or business associates tomorrow? Would you even want to see tomorrow? How can anyone be rational? It's difficult to see ahead even an hour with this atmosphere. Your future can even die here. Older children may run to the street for refuge, but where can this little one go? Escape from loneliness travels many streets. And some, as we've seen, are a dead end. What of this one? Is this just a safety valve for frustration? One child guidance authority called it a very destructive process in which adults allow the children to be involved. Youth has always tended toward rebellion. But there is a tragedy in this generation's revolt against what is normal. And as the pace increases, the fads become more extreme. Some may seem harmless enough, but the current trend is cause for serious concern. Other generations of young people have rebelled too, but they've had strong family ties, neighborhood ties, national ties. They knew they could always come back home when they got tired of trying to rebel. Today, they don't have these ties to fall back on. Within the next 60 seconds, another family somewhere in the United States will be strained to the breaking point. It is a pattern repeated every minute. And for each home that breaks, there are hundreds more in every community that are merely limping along. It is not surprising then that from this heritage, we have a generation of teenagers set adrift, unsure, looking for something, but not knowing what. Many young persons today have nothing to go back to and it shakes their security. Would you want anyone you know to face such a danger without assistance? You have something to fall back on. I know some of my own schoolmates have faced some of the problems you've just seen. It disturbs me very much. But my father and mother have been very kind to me. They've given me a standard to live by. They have introduced me to a source of right principles and security I never want to be without. And I feel somehow that I should do something, too. That is why you may see me sometime calling at one of our neighbors, like you see me doing here. To see me, you might think she's probably borrowing a cup of sugar or going to see a girlfriend. But I'm doing something that I enjoy more than anything else in the world. I'm talking to them about the security I feel in life. 
I'm talking to them about the Bible. That's my girlfriend. I studied the Bible in my spare time with her in her home for a while, and now she's going along with me. She was all mixed up at one time, but now we sure have good times together. Children whose home life is complete are satisfied, like this young French girl. Security in the home frees their minds to develop those qualities that will make them mature men and women. The intimacy of such close family ties opens many opportunities for loving guidance. This creates a secure future for these young ones by giving them a moral code they can rely upon. But is the source of such a moral code just a happy and well-regulated family? What heritage is it that can give a child the stamina to stand up for right principles? The security he must have for a happy and honorable life. Is it beyond our reach? This young French boy is talking to a stranger. He's talking about the Bible. Why? Because it is a part of him. His desires are expressed here. He's found a basis for confidence and hope. The Bible is real. It is alive. It's warmth to him. No matter where you might be, the Bible is a universal book. In France or Britain or the United States, its appeal is to all kinds of men. It provides a foundation for men from all walks of life, for men of all nations. Following Bible principles builds a solid family foundation. These principles maintain strong family unity. Bible principles establish the proper relationship of the family members. They draw father and son together. They make training a pleasure and work a source of accomplishment. But putting the Bible into your life doesn't mean taking out all the fun. It's really a sharp thing you do. It adds balance and sanity to living. I'm worried, thing. All right. We shook him up enough. Shook him up enough, thing. You got him. Try to pass him, thing. This is good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you have a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. There is no substitute for a father and a mother. Children need the companionship of other youngsters, yes, and they need love and companionship from their parents. But they need supervision at home even more. Parents who are interested in what their children are doing usually have children they can rely upon. Oh, I had such a good time, Janet. She's making real progress in her home Bible study, and today she had her neighbor in for the discussion. And she said she never knew the Bible could be so interesting. That's wonderful. Oh, that brush thing looks so good. I wish my had turned out. Can you come in with my skin, please? Well, I think we'll have some time before supper. If you help me with the salad. All right, I'll go wash my hands. Okay. Maintaining a happy family means maintaining a proper perspective. Children respond to love. They're not ashamed to show loving attention in return. Is this not a reward in itself to a parent with a realistic viewpoint of life? We got home just about half hour before you did. Say, Stevie, how did you make out with that school exam today that you were so worried about? Oh, that. I didn't do bad at all. As a matter of fact, I'm sure glad that you helped me with that problem. That's the one that we had. A closely knit family isn't an accident. Nor is the tie of kinship enough. The family that reads the Bible together lives the Bible together. And all this congregation will know that neither with sword nor with spear does Jehovah save. Because to Jehovah belongs the battle, and he must give you men into our hand. And it occurred that the Philistine rose and kept coming, and drawing nearer to meet David. And David began hurrying and running toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. 
Then David thrust his hand into his bag and took a stone from there and slung it so that he struck the Philistine in his forehead and the stone sank into his forehead and he went falling upon his face to the earth. So David with a sling and a stone proved stronger than the Philistine and struck the Philistine down and put him to death. And there was no sword in David's hand. And David continued running and got to stand upon the Philistine. Then he took his sword and pulled it out of its sheath and definitely put him to death when he cut his head off with it. And the Philistines got to see that their mighty one had died and they took to flight. Boy, that was good. Wasn't it but children need more than entertaining Bible stories. They, they must be trained to think and apply Bible principles. But what does this account of David's mighty deed mean to you? We suppose you tell us. Well, Dad, um, it wasn't really David who saved the Israelites from um, Goliath. He said himself, Jehovah must give you men into our hands. Now, why do you say that? Well, Jehovah was David's God, and David trusted in him. That's the same. He was real brave to fight a giant. Sure he was. <clears throat> but why didn't anyone else want to fight him? Because they didn't have enough faith. That's why. Say, Daddy, didn't the account say that when the Philistines saw the giant was dead, they all ran away? That's right. Because they were following a man? Yes. Oh, very good, Susan. Now, do you remember another scripture on that? I do. Yeah. I do. Okay, Scott, go ahead and tell us. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help, but trust in God with all your heart, and he will direct your steps. Oh, very nice, Scott. But we trust you, Daddy, isn't that right? Of course it is, Sugar. You see, the princes that are mentioned in this psalm are men that don't trust in God. Did they make days? Our world is far advanced in scientific knowledge, but spiritual values have not kept pace. We can put a man in orbit, and send a rocket to the moon. Our grandparents could not, but they knew when a neighbor was sick, and they took him a bowl of soup. Our grandparents also read and believed the Bible. Have we gone too far, too fast? No one likes a busy day. But has the Bible principle of love for neighbor become too old-fashioned? Let's hop forward now. Pick up the cans of trash so we can hose down pavement. It's pretty day like this. We'll have lots of washcloths and want to lose out on it. You sure you ain't missed something? I want to know all the things I'm not going to do. Man, you drive a hard bargain. Why don't you get off my back? You must think you're some stuff ordering us around. Yeah, why don't you clean it up? We didn't mess it up. You don't need washing cars. People ought to wash their own. Someday, someone would set my old man straight. What does he think he is, anyway? Joe, I'm sorry, but I sure can't agree with you. I couldn't help but overhear the conversation when I drove in. Tell me, what are you trying to prove? That's your father. Why should you try to hurt him? Ever start to think about the way he feels? He wants a clean station because it means more business and a better reputation. Look, Jim, you don't understand how he's always on our back. <laughs> I can see how hunchback you are. Seriously, there are a lot of boys who'd like to work here on Saturdays, but you owe your father a lot in life. Yeah, but... He... Now, is he really bad? Why, everybody in the neighborhood likes him. He's really a good guy, always helping people out. You fellows aren't really so bad either, so what is all this? Other guys have off. They don't have to work weekends, and they don't get forced around. You'll consider funny if you just take things. It's yes sir business and all. You consider me funny? You're no. different. Why? Well, people expect you to be proper. People should expect everyone to be proper. Man has to have... Showing respect for proper authority seems difficult for many young people. There seems to be a sort of resentment against it. Even when parents are sincerely interested in their children and try to understand them, there's often a gap that develops between their thinking. But if an encouraging word spoken by a good friend at the right time can help fill that gap, isn't that the neighborly thing to do? My dad taught me it's good to have concern for one another, and I believe that. 
Wow, I'd better run. My mom's waiting. We've got things to do with Dad today. We'll see you fellas around. Hey, and don't leave any of those cans. Bye, Jim. Hello, Jim. Well, come on. What are you waiting for? <clears throat> secret formula for raising boys anyway. Why ask me? Well, the other day young Jim was in here and he really gave my boys a going over. They were kind of sassy and I guess young Jim doesn't go for that kind of talk. Anyway, Joe started deep into Jim and Jim just had to sit him straight. They did my boys good. You know, they always like Jim. Sort of respect him. I do too. He's a good boy. Polite, thoughtful. You know, always calls me Mr. Good. Well, anyway, he's a joy to have around. He's certainly not what you're finding so many young people today. I'm really glad he had enough interest in my voice to talk to them. Well, I'm glad you feel that way about it, Charlie. I wouldn't want Jim to interfere in anything if he weren't asked. Oh, no, no. But as for racing children, you know, I used to have a lot of trouble with young Jim, too. No kid. But we began to study the Bible. And Jehovah's Witnesses helped us to see that the Bible puts the responsibility for our children on us parents. And now that young Jim has become one of your hopes too, well, I can reason with him. Of course, as parents, why, we need a lot of help, too. You're telling me? And uh, companionship with one's child today. And I've found that Bible discussions, shared with the whole family regularly, has helped to bring us close together. There's so many things to talk about. Principles that are taught become deep-rooted. And, you know, Bible principles don't take freedom away from the young people. In fact, it probably gives them more freedom. Why do you say that? Well, they feel more secure because they know how far the rules of life extend. The disrespect you find in people today, young and old, stems from their insecurity, not knowing proper Bible principles. So they feel they have to prove themselves somehow. When they are secure, why well, they can afford to be more generous then with their time as well as with their manners. I know that young Jim was glad to help out your boys the other day. It's good to see that they appreciate it. Say, uh, why don't you come over to our home uh, tomorrow after you close up? It's our regular night for getting together as a family and talking about these very things. Well, I think I will. Good. In the fast pace of our generation, the gap between the thinking of father and son widens with every decade. It's too great to bridge without a controlling standard that both can accept and respect. The Bible provides this standard. It served successive generations for over 3,000 years. Can our generation be so different that the Bible is no longer adequate? A jet plane moves faster than an ox. But the minute the controls of both have the same basic emotions and the same common needs. And neither is sufficient to himself. Why cannot the same standard serve all men. The Bible book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is alive and exerts power and is sharper than any two-edged sword and pierces even to the dividing of the soul and spirit and of the joints and their marrow and is able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Can a better guide for living be found even in our modern space age? Whenever I'm faced with a problem like that, Billy, I like to see what the Bible has to say. Its standards are pretty sound, you know. We've broken away from Victorian standards. They're just a guilt complex. Puritanical standards of the Bible aren't good form anymore. What makes you think the Bible is puritanical or Victorian? Well, it is, isn't it? No, there's nothing narrow-minded or thinking about the Bible. The Bible's very frank. That's why the Lord's witnesses study it so carefully. But let me ask you, Billy, how many times have you changed your sense of value since I've known you? Well, that's all part of growing up, I guess. But life's not an experiment. It needn't be anyway. 
It's true the Bible sets a high moral standard. But did you know that every bad concept of living is discussed someplace in the Bible as a bad example? And I know you don't want to end up the way those people did. Oh, I believe in enjoying life. Hi. Well, so do I, but you don't have to break God's laws to enjoy life. My family really enjoys living. But why isn't the world better than if someone who believes in the Bible? Sure, why not? The world doesn't follow the Bible. Don't expect the majority of those you meet to really believe its standards. But you can, because thousands of girls our age who are Jehovah's Witnesses are doing it. And if you do, you'll have something that half this world is searching for and not finding. What is what that? What do you mean by that? A peace of mind and self-respect. Something the half Bible the world is searching Bible for Bible? and not finding. Peace of mind and self-respect out of the mouths of children. But the newer generation speaks only what it learns from the older generation. It may be agony and frustration, or it may be security and peace of mind. It may be loneliness and disappointment, or it may be happiness and fulfillment. It may be bitterness and hopelessness, or it may be an abiding faith and confidence in the future. Our young people today face a world that is full of violence, hatred, and loneliness. But there is also to be found security and contentment. As the Bible says, there is no fear in love. Perfect love throws fear outside. This is our heritage and our children's. It can be a happy heritage if Bible principles are taught and followed. But good or bad, its shaping is in our hands. The future of our young people today depends upon us. Their happiness must be our happiness. The newer generation will speak what it learns from us. And their lives will be richer and far more meaningful if we secure for them the future that most young people are really seeking. Peace of mind and self-respect. 